Salamu alaikum brothers and sisters. Sending the reward of Umrah to your departed loved ones or those unable to undertake the journey themselves is a profound expression of love and devotion. At Pure Passage we specialize in performing Umrah on behalf of your sick or deceased family members, ensuring they receive the sacred gift. We understand the challenges and impossibilities some face in embarking on this spiritual journey. Pure Passage is here to alleviate the physical and financial burdens, offering a professional and reliable service that takes care of every detail. Let us help you fulfill this obligation for your loved ones with utmost care and attention. Make it happen today, contact Pure Passage and secure this immense reward by performing Umrah on behalf of those close to your heart. Bi'ithni Allah. Alright guys, welcome back to the channel if you're new, my name is Bobby. Guys, today I have a different type of video for you. Today I'm not going to react to any type of YouTube video. However, I'm going to tell you about a book that I've been reading the past few weeks. The book is titled Confessions of a British Spy, British Amnity Against Islam. In this book, a British spy named Hamfer, working in the early 1700s, tells of disguising himself as a Muslim and infiltrating the Ottoman Empire with the goal of weakening it to destroy Islam once and for all. He tells his readers, when the unity of Muslims is broken and the common sympathy amongst them is impaired, their forces will be dissolved and thus we shall easily destroy them. We, the English people, have to make mischief and arouse schism in all our colonies in order that we may live in welfare and luxury. Hamfer intends ultimately to weaken Muslim morals by promoting alcohol and fornication. But his first step is to promote innovation and disorder in Islam by creating Wahhabism. Wahhabism, which is to gain credibility by being on the surface morally strict. For this purpose, he enlists a gullible, hot-headed young Iraqi in Basra, named Muhammad ibn Abdul al-Wahhab. Hemfa corrupts and flatters Abdul al-Wahhab until the man is willing to found his own sect. According to Hemfa, he is one of 5,000 British agents with the assignment of weakening Muslims, which the British government plans to increase to 100,000 by the end of the 18th century. Hemphal writes, when we reach this number, we shall have brought all Muslims under our sway, and Islam will be rendered into a miserable state from which it will never recover again. I'm certain my audience is familiar with Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. However, for people that do not know who he was, I'm going to read you a quick summary. Muhammad ibn Abdul al Wahhab ibn Sulman al Tamimi was a Sunni Muslim, scholar, theologian, preacher, activist, religious leader, jurist, and reformer from Najd in Central Arabia. He is considered as the eponymous founder of the so-called Wahhabi movement. Born to a family of jurists, Ibn Abdul Wahhab's early education consisted of learning a fairly standard curriculum of orthodox jurisprudence according to the Hanbali school of Islamic law, which was the school most prevalent in his area of birth. He promoted strict adherence to traditional Islamic law, proclaiming the necessity of returning directly to the Quran and Hadith literature, rather than relying on medieval interpretations, and insisted that every Muslim, male and female, personally read and study the Quran. So now I'm absolutely aware that some people call this book utter nonsense, other call it a forgery, they claim it is fake, they claim this so-called spy is not even real. I'm not here to convince anybody, nor am I taking a position. I just started reading the book. I find it interesting, however, I keep my skepticism as well. I'm simply going to read out a chapter and I want you guys to decide and tell me what you think. Do you believe this is a forgery? Do you believe this is real? Please post it in the comments 
section down below. Before we start the reading, guys, as always, if you enjoy my work, leave me a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and check out the links in the description box to further support this channel. All right, and now with no further ado, let's have a look. From time to time, a young man would call it our carpenter's shop. His retirement was that of a student doing scientific research, and he understood Arabic, Persian, and Turkish. His name was Mohammed bin Abdul Wahab Najd. This youngster was an extremely rude and very nervous person. While abusing the Ottoman government very much, he would never speak ill of the Iranian government. The common ground which made him and the shop owner Abdur Rida so friendly was that both were inimical towards the Khalifa in Istanbul. But how was it possible that this young man, who was a Sunni, understood Persian and was friends with Abdur Rida, who was a Shia? In this city, Sunnites pretended to be friendly and even brotherly with Shiites. Most of the city's inhabitants understood both Arabic and Persian and most people understood Turkish as well. Muhammad of Najd was a Sunni outwardly, although most Sunnites censored Shiites. In fact, they say that Shiites are disbelievers. This man never would revile Shiites. According to Muhammad of Najd, there was no reason for Sunnis to adapt themselves to one of the four madhabs. He would say, Allah's book does not contain any evidence pertaining to those madhabs. He purposefully ignored the ayat e karima on the subject and slightly the hadith. Concerning the matter of four madhabs, a century after the death of their prophet Muhammad salam, four scholars came forward from among Sunnite Muslims. Abu Hanifa, Ahmed bin Hanbal, Malik bin Anas, and Muhammad bin Idris Shafi. Some Khalifas forced the Sunnites to imitate one of these four scholars. They said no one except these four scholars could perform each jihad in Quran or with the Sunnah. This movement closed the gates of knowledge and understanding for Muslims. This prohibition of each jihad is considered to have been the reason for Islam's standstill. Shiites exploited these erroneous statements to promulgate their sect. The number of Shiites was smaller than one-tenth that of Sunnites. But now they have increased and became equal with Sunnites in number. So here he's speaking about the numbers in Iraq. This result is natural for each jihad is like a weapon. It will improve Islam's fiqh and renovate the understanding of Quran and Sunnah. The prohibition of each jihad, on the other hand, is like a rotten weapon. It will confine the madhabs within a certain framework, and this in its turn means to close the gates of inference and to disregard the time's requirements. If your weapon is rotten and your enemy is perfect, you are doomed to be beaten by your enemy sooner or later. I think the clever ones of the Sunnites will reopen the gates of each jihad in the future. If they do not do this, they will become the minority and the Shiites will receive a majority in a few centuries. That of course did not happen. The arrogant youngster Muhammad of Najd would follow his nafs, his sensuous desires, in understanding the Quran and the Sunnah. He would completely ignore the views of scholars, not only those of the scholars of his time and the leaders of the four madhabs, but also those of the notable Sahaba, such as Abu Bakr and Umar. Whenever he came across a Quranic verse which he thought was contradictory with the views of those people, he would say, the Prophet said, I have left the Quran and the Sunnah for you. He did not say, I have left the Quran, the Sunnah, the Sahaba, and the Imams of Madhabs for you. Therefore, the thing which is fart is to follow the Quran and the Sunnah, no matter how contrary they may seem to be to the views of the Madhabs or to the statements of the Sahaba and the scholars. During a dinner conversation at Abdur Rida's place, the following dispute took place between Muhammad of Najd and the guest from Qum, a Shiite scholar named Sheikh Jawad. Sheikh Jawad, since you accept that Ali was a Mujtahid, why don't you follow him like the Shiites? Muhammad of Najd, Ali is no different from Umar or other Sahabis. His statements cannot be of a documentary capacity. Only the Quran and the Sunnah are authentic documents. Sheikh Jawad, since our Prophet said, I am the city of knowledge and Ali is the gate, 
Shouldn't there be difference between Ali and the Sahaba? Muhammad of Najd, if Ali's statements were of a documentary capacity, would not the Prophet have said, I have left you the Quran, the Sunnah, and Ali? Sheikh Jawad, yes, we can assume that he, the Prophet, said so, for he stated in a hadith, I leave behind me Allah's book and my Ahu Bayt. And Ali, in his turn, is the greatest member of the Ahu Bayt. Muhammad of Najd denied that the Prophet had said so. Sheikh Jawad confuted Muhammad of Najd with convincing proofs. However, Muhammad of Najd objected to this and said, You assert that the Prophet said, I leave you Allah's book and my Ahu Bayt. Then what has become of the Prophet's Sunnah? Sheikh Jawad, the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah is the explanation of the Quran. The Messenger of Allah said, I leave you Allah's book and my Ahu Bayt. The phrase Allah's book includes the Sunnah, which is an explanation of the former. Muhammad of Najd, inasmuch as the statements of the Ahu Bayt are the explanations of the Quran, why should it be necessary to explain it by hadiths? Sheikh Jawad, when Hadrat Prophet passed away, his Ummah considered that there should be an explanation of the Quran which would satisfy the time's requirements. It was for this reason that Hadrat Prophet commanded his Ummah to follow the Quran, which is the original, and his Ahu Bayt, who were to explain the Quran in a manner to satisfy the time's requirements. Now the British spy is talking. I like this dispute very much. Muhammad of Najd was motionless in front of Sheikh Jawad like a house sparrow in the hands of a hunter. Muhammad of Najd was the sort I had been looking for, for his scorn for the time scholars, his slighting even the earliest four Khalifas, his having an independent view in understanding the Quran and the Sunnah were his most vulnerable points to hunt and obtain him. So different this conceited youngster was from that Ahmed Effendi who had taught me in Istanbul. That scholar, like his predecessors, was reminiscent of a mountain. No power would be able to move him. Whenever he mentioned the name of Abu Hanifa, he would stand up, go and make ablution. Whenever he meant to hold the book of Hadith named Bukhari, he would again make an ablution. The Sunnis trust this book very much. Muhammad of Najd, on the other hand, disdained Abu Hanifa very much. He would say, I know better than Abu Hanifa did. In addition, according to him, half of the book of Bukhari was wrong. Now I want to fast forward to the interesting part where the British spy says, I established a very intimate friendship with Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab of Najd. I launched a campaign of praising him everywhere. One day I said to him, you are greater than Umar and Ali. If the Prophet were alive now, he would appoint you as his Khalifa instead of them. I expect that Islam will be renovated and improved in your hands. You are the only scholar who will spread Islam all over the world. Muhammad, the son of Abdul Wahab, and I decided to make a new interpretation of the Quran. This new interpretation was to reflect only our points of view and would be entirely contrary to those explanations made by the Sahaba, by the Imams of Madhabs, and by the Mufassirs, the deeply learned scholars specialized in the explanation of the Quran. We were reading the Quran and talking on some of the ayat. My purpose in doing this was to mislead Muhammad. After all, he was trying to present himself as a revolutionist and would therefore accept my views and ideas with pleasure, so that I should trust him all the more. On one occasion I said to him, Jihad, fighting, struggling for Islam, is not fart. He protested, why shouldn't it be, despite Allah's commandment, make war against unbelievers? I said, then why didn't the Prophet make war against the Munafiks, despite Allah's commandment, make jihad against unbelievers and Munafiks? The ayat e karima quoted above commands to perform jihad against unbelievers. It does not define the type of the jihad to be performed. For jihad against unbelievers must be performed by fighting, and jihad against Munafiks is to be performed by preaching and advice. This ayat e karima covers the types of jihad. He said, the Prophet made jihad against them with his speech. I said, 
is the jihad which is fart commanded, the one which is to be done with one's speech? He said, Rasul Allah made war against the unbelievers. I said, the Prophet made war against the unbelievers in order to defend himself, for the unbelievers intended to kill him. He nodded. At another time, I said to him, Mutanika is permissible. He objected, no, it is not. I said, Allah declares, in return for the use you make of them, give them the mehr you have decided upon. He said, Umar prohibited two examples of muta practice existent in his time and said he would punish anyone who practiced it. By the way, muta nikah is a temporary marriage of sorts, essentially a loophole to fornicate. I said, you both say that you are superior to Umar and follow him. In addition, Umar said he prohibited it, though he knew that the Prophet had permitted it. Why do you leave aside the Prophet's word and obey Umar's word? He did not answer. I knew that he was convinced. I sensed that Muhammad of Najd desired a woman at that moment. He was single. I said to him, come on, let us each get a woman by Muta Nika. We will have a good time with them. He accepted with a nod. This was a great opportunity for me, so I promised to find a woman for him to amuse himself. My aim was to allay the timidity he had about people. But he stated it a condition that the matter be kept as a secret between us and that the woman not even be told what his name was. I hurriedly went to the Christian woman who had been sent forth by the Ministry of the Commonwealth with the task of seducing the Muslim youth there. So here the book alleges that not only British spies have been sent down to the Ottoman Empire and to Iraq, but moreover certain sex workers have been sent down to seduce the Muslim youth. I explained the matter to one of them. She accepted to help, so I gave her the nickname Safiya. I took Mohammed of Najd to her house. Safiya was at home, alone. We made a one-week marriage contract for Mohammed of Najd, who gave the woman some gold in the name of Meher. Thus we began to mislead Mohammed of Najd, Safiya from within and I from without. Mohammed of Najd was thoroughly in Safiya's hands now. Besides, he had tasted the pleasure of disobeying the commandments of the Sharia under the pretext of freedom of each jihad and ideas. The third day of the Mutanika, I had a long dispute with him over that hard drinks were not haram. Although he quoted many ayat and hadith showing that it was haram to have hard drinks, I cancelled all of them and finally said, it is a fact that Yejid and the Umayyad and Abbasid Khalifas had hard drinks. Were they all miscreant people and you are the only adherent of the right way? They doubtlessly knew the Quran and the Sunnah better than you do. They inferred from the Quran and the Sunnah that the hard drink is makruh, not haram. Also, it is written in Jewish and Christian books that alcohol is mubah. All religions are Allah's commandments. In fact, according to a narrative, Umar had hard drinks until the revelation of the ayah, you have all given it up, haven't you? If it had been haram, the Prophet would have chastised him. Since the Prophet did not punish him, hard drink is halal. Muhammad of Najd said, according to some narratives, Umar drank alcoholic spirits after mixing it with water and said it was not haram unless it had an intoxicating effect. Umar's view is correct, for it is declared in the Quran, the devil wants to stir up enmity and grudge amongst you and to keep you from doing dhikr of Allah and from namaz by means of drinks and gambling. You will give these up now, won't you? Alcoholic spirits will not cause the sins defined in the ayah when they do not intoxicate. Therefore, hard drinks are not haram when they don't have an intoxicating effect. Sneaky, sneaky British spy. He continues, I told Safiya about this dispute we had on drinks and instructed her to make him drink a very strong spirit. Afterwards, she said, I did as you said and made him drink. He danced and united with me several times that night. From then on, Safiya and I completely took control of Mohammed of Najd. In our farewell talk, the minister of the Commonwealth had said to me, we captured Spain from the disbelievers, in his view those are the Muslims, by means of alcohol and fornication. Let us take all our lands back by using these two great forces again. 
Now I know how true a statement it was. All right, guys, and this is it for today's video, or rather today's little book club over here. I really want you to post in the comment section what you think about this, because those are strong allegations, of course. Here, the British spy, if he truly existed, alleges, of course, that they corrupted Mohammed Abdul al Wahhab, that they corrupted him with alcohol, with fornication, and it continues on with the corruption. Later in the book, we see that they have disputes about fasting and many other Islamic practices as well. So if this is the truth, this would be, of course, horrendous and shocking. However, if those are just fake allegations, it's even worse, of course, because this would be an atrocity to slander this man. Yet again, please let me know what you think about this in the comment section. Moreover, let me know as well if you like this format, because I would like to proceed with this, and I would read you a chapter or two of a book that I'm reading at the current time. All right, guys, but this is it for today's video. If you liked it, leave it a thumbs up, subscribe Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and check out the links in the description box below to further support. And as always guys, may God bless you all, much love and peace.